me <laughs> to moderate this uh, fantastic set of panelists on a topic which is very uh, important, of course, uh, for think tanks. In, in an era we are talking about 24-7 media and about talking about relevance and so on and so forth. Last time I did this sort of a job of moderation uh, outside of the think tank space was really many years ago when I was on national television. Uh, uh, my, my particular network uh, or employer favored discussions where people are really shouting at each other, not of course Maya and Shivnath's network. But uh, so any sort of moderation uh, was not really part of the scene at all. All I was required to do was basically look agitated time again at the camera, intercept with a few questions, and basically then I would be left to my own device quite literally, where are you? You are wanting to check social media where, ironically, the news is actually happening. So, uh, to somewhat put it crudely and start the topic of discussion here, how do think tanks remain relevant in the age of social media? Um, we are talking about translating big ideas, as the agenda note put uh, for us, into about 140 characteristics. Where, you know, there is a, there's an inherent dilemma in this sort of a debate because you're looking at Think tanks, if you're looking, going by definition in terms of old school terms, you're looking at people and institutions which are largely academic, uh, which attach value to expertise, uh, which invests in the long view of uh, issues. It often produces research which is text and data heavy, uh, and often frowns upon scholarship which it looks as fast or as prevalent in mass media. Uh, how does this ethos then re reconcile with a platform like social media or other online, uh, uh, online platforms which engage with brevity, where brevity is valued, you're looking at short attention spans, and you're also looking at people engaging with content which is highly visual in its appeal. Um, I was also thinking about how, when you're thinking about this subject, you know, then how do think tanks remain relevant, remain engaged, and also uh, ensure that they are amplifying their influence in conversations that matter? Because that's ex effectively what this panel is talking about today. How do we effectively con convey our research agendas to our target audiences? Uh, which brings me to about four or five lines of inquiry that I want to set up for this panel. Uh, Number one, you know, we're looking at this entire exercise to be engineered towards the target audience. But then again, there's a problem. In all our statements of purpose and across think tanks, we're talking about how we want to engage both policymakers and the public. But isn't our research generally geared towards niche audiences? And then are we use, you're utilizing the democratization aspect of social media and online platforms to overcome this challenge? That's number one. Uh, number two uh, brings me then to the question of organization and culture. Perhaps uh, this is more relevant to my sort of think tank space, which is really government funded and not so much for privately funded think tanks, but something we need to think about. Uh, you took talking about investment when we're talking about breaking big ideas into 140 characters or bite sized chunks. You're talking about investment both in the hardware and the software aspect. In the hardware, you're looking at you know, new publishing models because you want social media, uh, it, it to be social media friendly. I, I think I read a paper uh, on the medium or something which said that, you know, one of the biggest, the, the surveys done in the US as far as think tanks are concerned, one of the biggest roadblocks in terms of people reading content was that they hated PDF formats and they couldn't share data which was available on that. So stuff like that, which is, which is not something we are geared, at least in India, to think about yet. Perhaps there are think tanks like ORF and the others which are doing a good job of this. And then, of course, the software in terms of talent and expertise, uh, which is, you know, has this sort of vision to communicate these research agendas in, uh, effectively, to influence conversations, to amplify this influence. Uh, in my case, and uh, perhaps it's slightly harsh, in organizations like mine, which are taking nascent steps uh, in this field, the person who's actually doing the uh, managing the Twitter feed, more important, most importantly, you know, is somebody from the IT department who really doesn't have the vision nor the expertise that is available on this table. So that's, we haven't really made that transition yet in that sort of thinking about these issues. Third, uh, is the challenge that academia generally faces of the relevance gap. This is, you know, there's a catch-22 situation. On one hand, um, you have this total focus in this era of trying to uh, keep up with social media and the information made. You want to focus on the tools. There's so much focus on the tools that you sometimes lose out on the message. So use social media platforms as broadcasting sort of tools. And you know, where is the question of engagement? 
The flip side to it is what is the character of this engagement? Are we, uh, how do you shield yourselves from sort of falling into the trap of amplifying existing echo chambers. That's a thing, that's, that's sort of a balance that one needs to maintain, and that's something that I'd hope this panel uh, answers. Then, of course, is the question of being relevant itself. Uh, is online presence, you know, the fact that you're gonna get a number of followers, your retweets, and so on and so forth, are they indicators of relevance? How does this panel think about that? Uh, and is that something we want to, we wish for? Is that, is that the future of things the way they are going? And finally, this whole question of sustainability. You know, this is a massive enterprise. You're talking about the West, think tanks in the West, I'm sure, are already engaging with this whole transition of, to the digital think tank. As I said, it requires that investment in human resource uh, as well as infrastructure. Are we ready for that in India? Are we having conversations for the same? And you know, considering the environment we also work under, uh, at least my, you know, my experience with this thing is we are very happy broadcasting information, but it's never sustained unless it's you know there's pressure from above. And we also take partake in certain, at least in my experience, in a lot of self censorship. So what are what are these conversations we are seeking to influence? Um, that's perhaps about five areas I thought this panel could deal with. I'm going to I'm going to not take any more time and hand it over to all the experts here. Um, we have a format where I think seven minutes for each of our speakers. Uh, we start with uh, uh, Shivnath Tukral. He's the managing editor, uh, director at Carnegie India. Also a very seasoned uh, television journalist. Uh, for most of us are aware of his uh, profile here in India. I'll hand it over to you, Shivnath. Uh, thanks so much, Ruti, and uh, thanks to Samir uh, for having us on the panel. Uh, this is a very uh, revealing panel. One, the conversation of the pointers that you just listed out could have sounded coming from a newsroom five years ago. How do we remain relevant? How do we uh, connect with the audience? Who is our audience? Are they watching us? Uh, is this headline better or is that headline better? And my uh, former colleague, Maya, who I have worked with in the newsroom, and I can tell you, uh, she has been uh, a part of two, three very historical events, uh, the Sri Lankan assassination attempt, 9-11, uh, and we have had this debate in our newsroom enough number of times. How do we innovate? Graphics, how do we innovate? Uh, headlines, supers, title supers, everything. So just to kind of uh, make sense of it, and you said seven minutes, so I'll try and stick to it. Uh, if there's been any better time for think tanks in this country, it's now. And one credit you can give is to the man sitting opposite me right there is Samir, because he has actually set the trend of how to use good content and also communicate it in a manner to a wider audience which is relevant, which is meaningful, and which is the one which actually takes the decision. Now, having done that, uh, and I think uh, I wish a lot of people are able to do that, the only challenge he will face, uh, we as startups will face at this point in time, is that the target audience that you talked about, thanks to social media, that definition of target audience has completely changed. Now, while you can keep pleasing uh, Latin's uh, Delhi, keep pleasing uh, Delhi's uh, central uh, governments, at the end of the day, for you to remain relevant, you have to realize that social media has forced upon us a redefinition of that target audience. So for example, I see many youngsters in this room, they are much more digitally savvy, they are the TG. They are not a part of Latin's Delhi, thank God, and uh, they will take some time to be a part of it. So <laughs> how do we remain relevant uh, uh, to these folks is very, very critical because you want them to work for you. Uh, you want to cater to their intellect, but you don't know, have any means to communicate. So hence, social media has changed the definition of target audience. I think the role of 140 characters is being overemphasized, according to me. Um, as I said, if there's any better time for good content, it is now. And the reason why I say that is that it's like saying that I'm a very digitally savvy organization, but hey, I don't have any research. Oops. So what do I sell to the world? At the end of the day, good content, irrespective of any communication technology in the world, has always survived. So you can go back to the US right now. People wrote off the digital um, uh, strategy of New York Times is paying off. Washington Post, after Jeff Bezos came in, everybody said, oh, this is the doomsday of our journalism. The capitalists have taken over. But hey, Washington Post is one of the most digitally savvy organizations. Why? Because he understands the target audience, he understands the metrics and what needs to communicate. Uh, so I don't think the role of good research and good content is going anywhere. Unfortunately, and I say it with a great sense of sadness that my previous colleagues in journalism and Maya can vouch for it as well, 
journalists do not have the luxury anymore to indulge in good content. The pressure on them to fight the TRP war by putting 25 boxes on screen and shouting at everybody who speaks is become such a norm, they don't have the luxury to sit back and say, okay, let me just sit and process and analyze this. They're actually behaving as if their brains have become computers and they can instantly analyze everything and put out. It's not possible. Human brain cannot do it and thank God, think tanks do not have artificial intelligence as yet. So <laughs> my point is at the end of the day, do not discount the power of analysis, human analysis, the power of good writing, the power of good messaging, and the power of being able to cut through a lot of maze of information that is coming through. So I think the onus is on think tanks right now to reinvent themselves by saying, look, we will not give up on good content. That's my, that's my holy grail. I, that's, that's the core on which I function. And only then I will think of the digital adoption. Now, the whole idea about this whole tools and excessive focus, um, and I'm new to the think tank world, and I must always thank Samir for doing this to me, but there are way too many Twitter commentators in this country right now who think they are think tanks. <laughs> there is way too many analysis in 140 characters when what you need is actually sitting back and discussing it. So I think uh, while, of course, the cliche term would be a perfect balance is very critical, a perfect balance is difficult to achieve. So my only message, I, before I came in, I, and we have a lot of interns, our office is right here, so I was talking to our interns saying that the difference between academia and you rightly said, not to lose the relevance by uh, immersing only in research and not able to communicate. I think the, the biggest challenge for good think tanks and good research organizations is how do you also remain relevant by staying connected to your audience? And I go back to my first point, and that's where I think good research capabilities are critical, how you are able to identify who your stakeholders are, uh, and thank God we are not for profit, so I don't have the pressure of TRPs on my head. Uh, Maya still has for some reason. Uh, she's a, actually, she's having best of both the worlds, so <laughs> she can talk, talk about it a little bit. But so at the end of the day, uh, just to wrap my seven minutes is over, right? I'm getting over. So uh, just to wrap it up, do not discount good research, good content. At the same time, do not be oblivious to the power of communication. If you can marry both in a balanced manner, don't get swayed by excessive commentary on Twitter and Facebook. There are many more innovative ways of doing it, by the way. I mean, New York Times has shown how, in a single piece on a timeline, graphic illustration can make a, a huge difference. I'm surprised that in India, not too many people uh, use video blogs yet. I mean, we are hungry for uh, video because we both are trained like that. But nobody uses video blogs as much as they should. Video is the next form of communication. I mean, you look at a Google and a Facebook and a Twitter, everybody's striving for that video market. The YouTube is almost like passe. It's history now. So how do you do instant video communication? Those things will matter more. So don't get... Uh, uh, go, don't go to any extreme like the politicians have in today's day and world and uh, how journalists have either extreme right or extreme left. Balance is very critical. Come back to the middle and balance and marry both together. Wait, my, thanks, thanks, Shivnath. Um, I'm going to take the point that Shivnath made about you know, uh, breaking stereotypes in terms of content uh, for think tanks. But you know, one of the questions this agenda I know brought out, you know, do new, does dealing with social media and in the formats, take away, and the way it's formatted, take away in terms of the academic value of what you're trying to put out. So going back to my first question, how are we imagining our target audiences? And are we not giving them enough credit? Uh, thanks a lot, Shruti, and you know, Shivnath has covered a lot of what I was hoping to say. Um, just on that that last note, where you talked about uh, you know video, I think video. I'll get, I'll come to your question in a minute. But video is such an interesting and important tool. We have worked in television and and the visual medium all our lives, and we understand the impact of actually marrying an image to content. Uh, and just as an aside. Um, my 12-year-old nephew aspires, or is currently a vlogger. Um, he identifies himself on Instagram as a liberal. Uh, he has a hashtag that says Michelle Obama 2020. He's 12. Um, and he has a Samsung phone on which he's attached a lavalier microphone. Made me buy him a tripod for his uh, 12th birthday present and goes around the streets of New York City shooting video, asking questions to people and uploading it on his YouTube channel. So uh, I mean, as far as technology is concerned, 
I have no idea anymore what he's talking about. Um, but you know, coming back to your questions, so this is the importance of the visual and really where we are. Think tanks, I think, straddle a very interesting line between purely academic institutions and the mainstream media. So you're providing a service which gives you context and analysis uh, without, with the rigor of academic research, but without the, the turgidity or the, the heaviness of the language, and without the perhaps frivolousness of what, as Shivnath pointed out, mainstream media has be become, and uh, driven largely by the, the fact that journalists are running against rolling deadlines, are running against TRPs, are running against their competition on, on the next channel, or a newspaper as the case may be. And just to highlight how some think tanks have actually managed to, to straddle this line very interestingly. I mean, we all, we all read the Foreign Affairs Journal uh, and Foreign Affairs website. That's something that the Council on Foreign Relations brought out uh, about 20, 25, 30 years ago, something like that. Uh, that's a very interesting way in which a purely policy-based institution has been able to mass market uh, intellectual thought and, and research analysis. We've now crossed that stage of that heavy journal with 2,000 word, 3,000 word essays that would come out once in two months uh, to them having adapted themselves as well to a website where they're uploading comment and, and content on a daily basis to this challenge with social media. So of course, Foreign Affairs has a, has a Twitter handle. They tweet their articles out. They're inviting comment, etc. cetera. Um, let's not just focus on Twitter and the 140 characters. I think the idea of social media is accessibility, uh, much more than the brevity of uh, what you can say. Communication always has been, no matter what medium you use, communication has always been about effectively communicating your message, whether you do it in 140 characters or whether you do it in 2,000 words. It's, it's about how you write, it's styles, it's language, it's the, it's the flow of language, the ease of vocabulary. These things are very important. And vocabulary isn't just words printed in black and white. Uh, it's, as Shivnath pointed out, it's the vocabulary of the visual medium, it's the vocabulary of software, uh, it's the vocabulary of hashtags and, and photographs. These are new ways we're adding on to our vocabulary. So think tanks are in that interesting space where they have to, in a sense, adapt. They have to retain their commitment to rigor and research and adapt to these challenges, as you pointed out. I mean, this room is full of youngsters. Uh, I don't know how many of them read the newspaper in a newspaper format, uh, or even for that matter, go on to a newspaper website's e-paper edition to understand how a paper decides what's on a front page and what's on a comment page. They're looking at links that are just popping up on the home page, and somebody's essentially curating that. Um, I think. The challenge, and I think on this, it's, it's both a challenge for think tanks as well as mainstream media, because in both places, fundamentally, you have a filter. You have an editorial curator who's going to be processing what information is coming in, deciding how to place it, um, deciding what kind of a headline might be catchy, what image may be right with that image, uh, you know, with, with that content uh, as the case may be. Social media kind of breaks down these barriers. It breaks down actually any sense of a filter. Uh, as I think Shivnath pointed out, that everybody is an analyst in 140 characters. But the truth is everybody is not. And eventually you will also find that and this, this sort of points to, Shruti, what you were mentioning earlier about how many followers does one have and, um, you know, how many retweets does one get, etc., things like that. I think people, even on social media, have their own ways of um, trying to identify who is going to be someone they want to listen to when it comes to a particular topic. We all make those choices, perhaps consciously, perhaps subconsciously. So the blue tick on Twitter, for example, is very important for anybody in this room. Um, whether you have five followers or whether you have uh, 
you know, six million followers, it doesn't matter as long as you have a blue tick. Uh, how many of those blue tick followers retweet your comments will then add value and weight to what you have said, as opposed to how many arm janta, as the case may be, the arm admi uh, is going to do that. So there is a hierarchy that's establishing itself on social media as well. It's not perhaps as democratic and non-hierarchical as you say, because that blue tick is the hi hierarchy on social media. And I think think tanks will aspire to getting that blue tick next to their name. Analysts in think tanks will aspire to getting that blue tick next to their name as well. So these are some of the challenges. But again, I, and I think I completely agree with Shivnath on this, unless you have content, it really doesn't matter how many words you use and what you say. If you have the weight of content, if you have the weight of research, the challenge for think tanks is to present that in a way that's going to make it appealing and interesting for this room of youngsters to actually click on those links. So yes, it does mean graphics, it does mean video, it does mean uh, snappy headlines, it does mean hashtags. And, you know, the old suits have to sort of come to terms with the new reality. I think that's just the way it is for all of us. I have interns around me who are in their 20s and I'm not able to keep up with them sometimes when they, th when, you know, when they talk about how they communicate uh, their views, where they get their information from. I'm still plowing through printed sheets of paper and marking with a pen and highlighter and they're recording on their phone as I speak, just so they can remember what I've said. So these are, these are ways that technology challenges every passing generation. And I think every passing generation then has that need to step up to that challenge. And I think think tanks fall into the same category. Thanks. Think tanks, she, she, Maya spoke about think tanks uh, sit and the importance of content and the amount of information we are sitting on. But this investment in terms of curating this information so that it, you know, you're part of the uh, relevant and influential conversation, so to, uh, so to speak. Are we, have we made that investment? Right. Uh, thanks, Shruti. So I think there are two separate questions really here. One is the manner in which you go about uh, now, yeah, yeah. the manner in which you go about doing research and the second is how you push the research out and one must parse these two pretty carefully before you come to any sort of conclusion about both challenges and opportunities presented by new platforms and social media and so on. Uh, so far as techniques of research go, I don't think they have drastically changed at all in the last hundred and so many years. You know, because there is a cer certain methodology that we are taught as researchers to understand a new problem. Uh, tweets are part of the data that you may use, but tweets are definitely not what help you conclude on a particular answer. So I think uh, the methodology is something that cannot be disrupted simply because the human brain processes information, arrives at conclusions, draws inferences, etc. in a certain way. And each discipline has its own methodology to look at a subject. For instance, I work on probably the one space which is fast changing. Like I wrote my paper on civilian drones, and in two months, you know, there is already a techno legal solution offered by Amazon. Uh, you know, so these are areas where you cannot ever possibly look at your paper as a conversation stopper or as a be all end all in terms of offering policy solutions. It is in any case only part of a larger conversation on this subject. So that's the sort of methodology, that's the sort of discipline that you work on and you have to internally adjust for that. So good researchers never get lazy and good researchers never break the broad parameters within which that discipline functions. Because if you do that, then you are no longer a good researcher in that you know, space. So that's the first uh, thing. And so whatever platforms emerge, you cannot ignore this. And if you do, then you are no longer you know, fit enough to call call yourself a researcher. Now coming to the way you push out the research and that's where I think a uh, lot of the conversation uh, today has to necessarily look, focus on uh, and uh, there I think there are two or three broad set of issues. One, are think tanks the way they are conventionally structured capable to 
push research using this uh, medium. Uh, honestly, it, I can only really speak for Carnegie because I've never worked in any other think tank. And I think uh, being a startup, being a new organization, that's something that, ha and also having uh, Shivi to head the organization, I think, uh, you know, from the outreach and funding perspective, it has really helped in the sense that uh, these are perspectives I didn't personally have as a researcher when looking at uh, uh, technology research and so on, policy research in an academic setting at UPenn. Uh, but here, you know, that this is something that uh, we have been sort of trained to look at, to look at both in terms of gathering data using uh, social media, as well as pushing out our research in a, in a better way. So whether it's an event that we do like the Technology Summit or the sort of papers, we are uh, fundamentally, it's in our DNA to sort of use uh, social media tools. Uh, do all organizations have that? Uh, unfortunately, no. I say unfortunately because finally, Whatever space you're working in, one cannot work in it and deliver results the right way to push your research and so on without respecting the platform. So this is basically nothing but respect for a certain medium which has evolved in the last uh, few years. Uh, I mean, I am a copyright uh, lawyer in my earlier avatar and I saw this happen with the entertainment industry. What fundamentally happened with the uh, big entertainment companies is a lack of respect for the fact that digital was really disrupting what's going on in your space. And as a result of this fundamental lack of uh, respect, what you then do is you try to shut down your torrent sites, you sh try to shut down you know, all the different guys who are disrupting the space, while there is somebody else who fundamentally respects this way of communicating information, content and so on, like a YouTube and today if you look at it like a Netflix or a Hotstar and so on. And these guys have obviously been able to, uh, you know, innovate much better in this space while delivering the same sort of content or different kinds of content using data analytics and so on to find out what the next frontiers of research are and so on. So unless you develop a respect for the medium, you are never going to identify the topics which you could work on, right? I, I'm not saying, for instance, that you pander to the popular will. But there are certain topics which are of more interest because they have much more impact on society today. So you understand new social phenomenon, you understand uh, you know, new ways of uh, gathering your data and so on, only if you have a fundamental respect for the medium. So I think to that extent, all think tanks must move in the direction of building these capabilities. But does that mean as researchers you pander to what people think in terms of retweets of your work and so on? I personally am I, I'm not very active on Twitter. But I don't think for that matter my work is less respected as someone working on technology and policy. In fact, looking at the feedback for some of my work over the last one year, I think it is in fact amplified. Uh, as opposed to being in a pure academic setting, being at a think tank, I think it's actually you know, amplified. The kind of people who see your work, the kind of observations on it, but you have to respect the medium to understand a that this is only part of a conversation because that's the nature of the kind of space you're working in and two there are ways in which you can push your research better because there are you know other people out here who look at it you know who evaluate it from that perspective so i think if you can fundamentally factor in these things as a researcher but continue to stick to the disciplinary tools of research for your specific discipline i think you're fine right Thank you so much, Anand. Uh, I'm going to uh, take some of the points that Anand spoke about and come to you next, uh, Neeraj Kumar, who is the uh, managing editor at the Asian Development Research Institute. This thing about, you know, how uh, institutionally sometimes uh, organizations are not uh, structured to deal with uh, platforms like social media, especially those which crunch heavy data. Now, the flip side to the argument might be that you know, social media could be leveraged infinitely to put out this data, which otherwise would only cater to niche audiences. How, are we, how, how is your institute uh, looking to balance things? Yeah. <coughs> thank you, and uh, before I speak, I would like to thank Dr. Saran, uh, ORF, TTCSP, and McKinsey for calling me here on this forum. Uh, I would rather be speaking from a subaltern point of view, uh, because uh, this uh, forum is also about national, regional, and global partnerships. So nobody has so far talked about the regional partnerships. So I would rather stick to that. And uh, very beautifully put out by uh, Maya and uh, uh, Mr. Tukral and Anand too. Uh, how we are uh, kind of trying to put everything uh, into bite size and how social media faces different kind of challenges in academic research and all. 
Personally, I think that uh, India is still, I mean, not talking about Delhi and Bombay, but about other regions. We are still kind of in a phase where it's, there is kind of transition taking place between acad from academic research to policy research. We are still, in the, in a, it's, it's morphing into that gradually. What, do, what we do at our institute, uh, we are a public policy, uh, we are an economic and a public policy institute, economics and public policy institute. Uh, we have seen that most of the researchers, the kind of challenge they face is not uh, re directly related to and directly relevant to social media. That th the, the challenge they face is to how to connect to uh, lawmakers, basically, and the lawmakers are usually represented by bureaucrats. So this connection between the bureaucrats and academic researchers is very crucial here. And most of the times we have seen that even uh, many of our bureaucrats, I don't know what happens in Delhi, but in Bihar or in maybe in Uttar Pradesh as well, most of them are not, I mean, that tech savvy or they're not aware of social media tools. I mean, even they are already, they're using it personally for personal linkages and all. Uh, but yeah, uh, so a recent trend that has taken up, that is catching up uh, gradually, is that uh, they are trying to conduct dissemination workshops where they do present their research findings into as simple a way as possible for them because it's, uh, it's really very difficult for complex ideas to be broken into uh, 140 characters or something like that. So they are facing this challenge, obviously. And uh, they organize dissemination workshops. They also are trying to leverage their pool of sur field surveyors, the field surveyors they employ in their research. They are also being uh, made aware of how to use different technology tools and all uh, social media tools. But this is not really catching up. In most of the regional places, we are still relying on video conferencing. We are still, nowadays they are using a Skype and all. So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a real concern for all of us here. Now coming to the question of losing academic value of a particular research, because we are still in the transition mode. So academics always fear that if I put out a particular thing too simple a way or uh, by using social media tools or by something like that, uh, we would be losing academic value. But the thing is that what I, uh, what I stand for is that uh, you should make it simple, not simpler. By that way, you will not only be maintaining the sanctity of your uh, literature, but also, the, uh, but also be utilizing, the, but, but also be realizing your purpose of reaching your or accessing your uh, targets. Because uh, if you are not reaching your targets, the, the, the people who are uh, going to formulate those policy decisions are the, and the people, those who are going to bear those policy decisions, they should be kept in loop. So we have to rather keep it simple, not simpler. If we make it simpler, then uh, yeah, people have been trying to make it simpler by way of uh, using Twitter and all. But then that also uh, poses a threat in terms of a kind of sensationalization of a particular thing. That should not happen. Sensationalization is a thing that should be left to media only. <laughs> So academic research is still some kind of uh, domain uh, where we need to kind of create a wall, create a, what we call, we use the term in the computer world, firewall. So that firewall is needed here. But researchers must find a way to, uh, uh, must find a way, must find avenues to uh, disseminate their results in a way that not only respects their academic, uh, academic uh, uh, framework, but also reaches the people who are really the, going to be the beneficiaries of the research. So I think I have uh, finished my important points. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Neeraj. I will come back to that firewall comment in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, next we have uh, uh, Mr. Sambandan, who is the Chief Administrative Officer at the Hindu Center for Public uh, Politics and Public Policy. Uh, Mr. Samadhan, I think out of all the questions, uh, all the panelists here and the comments we've made today, you're perhaps the best poised in terms of marrying this academic rigor with, of course, having a strong media uh, institutional backing, you know, which has already uh, experimented in terms of long forms and modularization and so on and so forth. So I'll hand it over to you to share with us your experiences. Um, thank you, Shruti. Uh, thank you all previous speakers. I think you all summed it up beautifully. Maya, especially <coughs> half my job by saying where exactly we stand. We stand at the sweet spot of academic rigor and journalistic use of access. My only request when I send out uh, somebody to ask to write for us is they would normally, it's, it's quite opposite from you know, my previous, uh, what I did a few years ago, 
which is, uh, we would only say not more than 500 words. <laughs> I tell them not less than 2,500 <laughs> words. I tell them no citations is not going. Two non-negotiables, 2,500 words at the least, <coughs> citations. Uh, um, but what are we doing really? Well, where are we? I'll try also to simultaneously address um, the questions raised by Shruti at the beginning. Uh, but I must also express my thanks on all our behalf to McKinsey, Observer, and uh, Jim's uh, DTCSP for including this as part of a discussion. This particular element of um, media, in a way, and uh, communication in this part of the discussion. Because as uh, Lawrence McDonald, uh, Vice President of Communication for Center for Global Development, quite pertinently said, and I quote, journalism is collapsing. And that's created a vacuum in which think tanks have a very different and special role to play. Jim has done a lot of work on this, and uh, whenever I was looking up for a lot of work, right from we were down, we've been trying to think, what is a think tank doing? It's easier to say what a think tank doesn't do. We don't do research for the sake of research. We are not studentless universities. We are, to sum up, uh, in the process of policy communication, uh, with, which is informing citizens of the existence of, existence of policy and persuading them to participate in it or comply with the policy requirements. That's from uh, Michael Ann, uh, who wrote as recently as 2014. So Shruti talked very, uh, very well about uh, the niche. What is the niche audience we're looking at? We are, we are here, and we've been here for a very long time, since, say, Brookings or World Star Pioneer, it's because of two failures. One is a market failure, and one is a state failure. The state intervenes whenever there's a market failure. And because there's a market failure, um, we also need to put in our two bits about it. And uh, what kind of audience are we catering to? Primarily, it's, it's a very, very, let's, let's not kid ourselves, the primary audience is the state. And the state, uh, Max Weber saw the state as one which builds a monopoly over violence, over revenue. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, Habermas would see the state as a hegemon. But we as think tank uh, and as journalists see the state as one which is the possessor of asymmetric information. There is severe information asymmetry which we think tanks try to bridge through the creation of knowledge. And also if we take, uh, with, 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 with a lot of respect to all think tanks all over, uh, think tanks also tend to become uh, places where state expertise is drawn uh, from people who have been part of the state mechanism. Maya, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so states that draw expertise from uh, state players. So that sort of takes part of the niche argument. The other end of the niche argument is, are we influencing citizenry adequately enough to make informed choices? The answer to that could perhaps be better known from and through social media because of its trackability. In our previous, uh, me as a print journalist, I would be happy that, okay, I've written, I've written on this, I've written on that, and the whole world has read it. I go home, sleep happily, get my adrenaline rush, go again, and go for an next breaking story, thinking the whole world has read it again. But reality check comes in with social media because you open up and you see, oh, since inception, the Hindu Center, for instance, has got just about 1.8 million page views. Oh, okay. So the whole world has not read us. But okay, 1.8 is pretty good to start with. And then we go on to see we, we disaggregate it. And coming to our core issue, I think, are we really overstating the cost for social media? Because when I tracked, when we tracked our uh, responses, the highest was on, on force through reference. The next was through uh, reference because we also have a newspaper which cross posts our uh, posts and we get that. The social media didn't fare up there. Two reasons, A, we are getting it wrong, or B, the, social, the audience in the social media is not the audience that is interested in the issues that we take up and go on. I would tend to place equal weightage on both, but for, uh, for want of uh, real uh, res researched out issues, that's an, uh, that's an issue which we really need to have a look at. Um, the other, oh, 
the what was fascinating really and what I think should come as a good encouragement for all think tanks is that the organic search was the second largest second largest uh, audience which landed onto our website were organic searches. So that's where we as journalists, as Maya had said, as um, Shivnath had said, um, what we, how we mediate what we give, how we curate it, how we mediate mm -hmm. it. Because uh, there could be a lot of research which is happening. Research for the sake of research. How much, how many of us do, like when, uh, whenever we take up a particular issue, I try to find out from universities, has anybody done some work on that? And it will be languishing in a, in, a, in a thesis shelf, dust gathered, nothing at all. So we have a very important role in, in bringing what is there, which is of value to the reader to make an informed citizenry. Now, are we going to crack the other harder one of influencing state policy? I don't know. My frank answer is, I think not. Because states by nature, and pardon me, all who've been in states as part of state mechanisms, and uh, are in state mechanisms, states by nature assume, rightly or wrongly, but always rightly in their sense, that they are the repository of all knowledge. And uh, that's where a unidirectional communication comes. Why have think tanks uh, did a, done a bit more, perhaps one could say, in, in the US than in countries like India is because of lateral, lateral movements available between the two spaces of the state and the academia. Correct. So that, that sort of takes us to both niche and organization, if I would say so. Then relevance also, I think we've touched upon as to how relevant really we are. Counts on, uh, we also had a list of top 10 red articles since inception. And uh, do, not, do not underestimate the reader. He knows exactly what he wants, or she, she wants. She wants to read about elections. She wants to read about specific people. She wants to read about specific issues. And do not think that economics, because one, one real issue which you've got to confront, adapt, and understand. I, I may be uh, happy about it as my academic grounding is in that particular field. But um, think tanks in India, perhaps all over the world, are social science oriented. And in India, they're largely economics oriented. Mm -hmm. So that's another space which is still relevant because uh, when the famous Bhagwati Sen debate came up, years ago, compared to now, in the immediacy of time. It was the last century, but that still ranks as one of the top 10 red articles. <coughs> so we've got to create our own relevance in that way. And um, about uh, how, um, sorry, the self-consciousness, is it? Last point uh, you said? Uh, I said, you know, how sustainable is yeah. this exercise? Is the sustainability or the exercise of... Uh, or is it a matter of sure survival? I mean, you know, you need to engage in this. Yes, I, I think... I think as long as there's one, as long as there's a phenomenon in which one, one, uh, one, one monkey looks over a bridge and ten monkeys come over and see what's there, the sustainability is very much there. There is, uh, I, when I started my research, I was told research is a jealous mistress. Then I came to journalism and I said, Jeal journalism is a jealous mistress. It's just, it's a glutton. The newspaper, uh, sorry, I would say newspaper because I come from newspaper. The media are a gluttonous industry. There is absolutely no end to it. But for that, again, don't insult the reader because she knows what to pick and she knows what to dump. So there must be something going viral, but that is absolutely no indication of <coughs> endorsement, of acceptance. It's an indication of interest. And you, as long as we as a community uh, using our respective expertise and respecting the audience, I think we have a long, 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 long way to go, and we are indeed sustainable. Are we financially sustainable? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that because um, I can say that uh, I was looking for think tanks supported by newspaper, by media organisations. Perhaps with the exception of ORF, which started as a brainchild of uh, an editor, um, I can say that there aren't many. Jim could correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, McKinsey is self-supporting. It's about, as, as, a, as a newspaper organization, what we thought, the founding, uh, founding thought of this was to create an informed citizenry using a unique advantage which newspapers have. And 
which the credibility which the Hindu enjoys, and I am sure that we will have a sustainable. Right. Thank right. you very much. I hope you've taken all your questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Mandan. You've engaged with most of my queries, and so did the panel. Uh, before I come back to them with my set of questions, I open this up now uh, for queries from uh, all of you. Um, I request you to please uh, introduce yourself and keep the questions short and so the comments short as well. Sir. Uh, Commodore Watson from uh, Chennai Center for China Studies. I think uh, what Mr. Sambandhan brought out has a lot of relevance to think tanks in my opinion. Because who are you reaching out to? You know, that is a major question which I think even the panel has tried to address. I think they have done a fascinating job. So unless think tanks know how to use the social media, you know, what are the numbers? Now, do we have any estimate of how many people are actually using the social media to promote think tank ideas? I don't know if there is any estimate. Now, he spoke about 1.8 million pages for a particular thing, whatever. Do we have similar kind of statistics available to us? Because only when you have these numbers, are you in a position, and what are they looking at? You know, like he brought out a valid point about the organic searches that are being used. If somebody wants to look at elections, he said, you know, they're going to look at the search, then look at the specificity. So I think the starting point for a think tank, in my opinion, is to have a separate division to monitor what's happening in the social media uh, <laughs> ecosystem and then shape their responses accordingly so that they're not left out of the race. You know, nobody wants to be left out of the race. You know, that's the point that is there. So I think there's a lot of lesson for think tanks in terms of how to first establish who is going to use your data, how many of them are going to use it, and how useful it is for you for your policy uh, research or academic research or whatever. So I would like to know if there's some estimate of numbers, percentages, size of the people who are using think tank data. Thank you, sir. Just, just before I come to you, ma'am. Uh, you know, IDSA does, we get a monthly report on the number of hits our articles get, who's tweeting what and which article did best in terms of a competition and all the scholars are encouraged to see, you know, this, my article got the maximum hits. But if you actually talk about engagement, we use social, I mean, I, and this is not a commentary on the website editor, which is something uh, to come to what Shivnath quipped in between, give me the funding. You know, we are, we are very, very resource trapped in terms of being able to dedicate that kind of manpower, which is something uh, to actually look at social media data and say this is what our audience is reading and engaging with. But that's, of course, a question for uh, this audience to take back and discuss. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Cleo Pascal from Chatham House. So I, I, this is very interesting. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, from the perspective of Chatham House, there are a lot of different sorts of think tanks. And, uh, and there's a, a big difference between our public and our private identities and, uh, and the, which, who we serve as an audience. So in order to serve uh, the public, uh, we just installed a media room because often the media is uh, more about kind of not Mr. Right, but Mr. Right now in terms of uh, cool. getting the story out very right. quickly. So instead of having to have our people go to the studios, we've put in a studio so we can connect to get it out really fast. Uh, we've also, in terms of the other topic about influencing policymakers, we put in a scenario room so that we can uh, run policymakers through scenarios and help them think about some of these complex issues. These actually aren't very expensive investments, but they're very helpful for getting across the, the thing. Um, we publish a lot, but a lot, of the, a lot of the most valuable product is actually not published. And if you look at other think tanks like CNA, they'll do a public report and a classified report. So I'd be interested to know whether some of the Indian think tanks are also going that route where they're not just for the public, but actually the value added is what isn't published. Um, my question is to all the panelists. Some of you mentioned um, the job, the role of uh, curating and filtering. But today, the, today technology enables me to confirm my biases. <coughs> By this I mean um, if I'm reading a particular article, Google will automatically understand my political inclinations and only provide me information in articles, videos, uh, bite-sized uh, news, according to what I like seeing. So how do think tanks and policymakers face this challenge? I mean, if I'm not willing to read anything that's beyond what I like, and that is true for a lot of uh, youngsters today, they're so confirmed with their own biases today, that it's very, very difficult to um, sort of get a message across. So how, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one last 
Uh, thanks, Shruti. Um, just I think this, the whole discussion was very interesting and revolves around four words. One is impact, right? How do you shape uh, uh, public policies? Because that's in the end what the prime driver is of think tanks. I think that's, that's a, an extremely important issue because uh, you don't want to be writing op-eds which, I mean, are retweeted a hundred times but have really no impact in terms of change. And uh, I think that's, that's really something, I think a discussion we should focus on, on what, who are we trying to target and what impact are we having. So sometimes you're having an impact through a private conversation as a think tanker, which is 10 times more valuable than 100 retweets or 10 op-eds, right? Uh, the second one is uh, access, and that's extremely important. I think, Maya, we discussed as a trilateral forum, I had a question about you, I mean, in terms of journalism and think tanks, uh, we see a shift in Delhi happening in many ways, as you see from uh, journalism to think tanks in terms of access to expertise in government. So I'm useless as a think tanker if, I'm not, if I don't have access and know what's happening inside the state, inside government, in that sense, specifically in foreign policy, but also could be health policy, technology, etc. And the last issue is expertise. I mean, who are think tankers, right? And I think Anand mentioned that also, and what is the added value they, they offer? And this is, I think, central to the issue of higher education. Uh, you can have this because you expertise because you worked in government and you know your issue inside out because you had 40 years in, in government working on this particular issue. You can have it as a journalist because you've been tracking it for a long time and you know what's happening. But I think the main one is also scholarship. And in India, I think it would be very interesting, and I see too little of this, the debate about what is the role of higher education in terms of expertise. What's happened in my field, foreign policy studies, international relations, to a school like the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, which used to be shaping debates and was set up to shape debates in the 50s and 60s, and has fallen off the record and is you know, hardly high, disregarded these days, to be very frank, in policy discussions. Guys, remember television stick. Yeah, <laughs> we are trained to do that. We are trained to tell people to do that now. Um, I'll just pick up a couple of points. So one with the young lady asked there, uh, where algorithms feed the agenda. Luckily, so far, think tanks are not led by algorithms. They are still led by people who, as Tino mentioned, are scholars and who we trust of having a balanced and a objective perspective what, of what issues are relevant and what issues actually add value. Uh, the bottom line at the end of the day is who are you trying to influence or impact? And that goes back to a point our uh, colleague made here on the panel, is the access to the lawmaker because there's an asymmetry of information and which addresses your point, is that sometimes private discussions add more value, but it is best after that, under the Chatham House rules, not to keep the outcome of that private. Publish it without quoting anybody to say that we added value to the pool of ideas or the pool of knowledge that we have tried to create. So everything goes back to who are you trying to uh, work with, who are you trying to uh, impact, and what is the value that they see in you. And, and Tino is right, there is uh, definitely in Delhi, and again, I come from Bombay for the last 15 years, I feel in Delhi, uh, because of this pressure of TRPs, pressure of performing at prime time, it has left created a huge vacuum which I think think tanks are rightfully going to fill. Now, we can do the same mistake. Uh, we can do the same mistake, and Tino, to answer your question, why did the School of International Relations uh, slightly become irrelevant? Because they didn't remain relevant to the audience that they should have connected to. I think that goes back to the same point with think tanks should not commit the same mistakes, which they are pretty, uh, uh, it has a potential of uh, falling prey to the same thing, trying to do things which are esoteric and ideas, but has no relevance to it. The last point I wanted to make is uh, the reason why you cannot rule out technology or the use of modern communication tools, and to answer your question, whether it's in Bihar or in Andhra Pradesh or anywhere, that governance will also get dependent on technology in a big way. So if you are present where governance is reaching already, they will see you as relevant. So today, fine, Delhi bureaucrats are very savvy in using uh, internet and Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp groups. That will disseminate further to the state level bureaucracy, state level, and even to the village level. I mean, there is a reason why brands are successful doing digital marketing in rural areas, because they know that the consumer is 
pretty savvy in doing that. So if your stakeholder is policymaker, your access will improve if you embrace technology and means that they are being forced to do given the governance uh, model in this country changes. So I think don't rule out technology. I am a big believer of it. I think uh, what Anand said, as Carnegie, we have done, I, I don't rule out using virtual reality to push out uh, some of the policy ideas that we, uh, is going to happen. Augmented reality is one going uh, is going to be a way where you can create a policy room where people can experience what are the various scenarios. So I think it's just the beginning. I think best to be on top of the curve. Right. Thanks, Maya. Yeah, I just want to um, address <laughs> a couple of things. Uh, you know, one I think with what uh, Mr. Sambandhan said, where we are in a situation where. And it's not particular to any dispensation, it's just the way bureaucracy and government seem to be functioning over here, is that the institutions that think tanks hope to impact and influence going forward um, are a little defiant or arrogant about their knowledge. They see themselves as the crucibles of knowledge, which is why perhaps even um, a university and a school, ultimately, if it's not in keeping with what political shifts may be taking place at that time will find themselves irrelevant. That's one. The second is uh, uh, what Shivnath said, which is that people in Delhi might be savvy uh, with technology, uh, with social media, uh, and, but how does that filter to the field? I'll just give you a small example. And this is as a reporter. Last year, the district collector uh, in, uh, it was in Bijapur, in Chhattisgarh, posted on Facebook the need for medical experts to come to Maoist infested um, areas because there were no doctors. There's a swank new hospital in Sukma, the district hospital, but there are no doctors. Brand new equipment, brand new facilities, nobody to come. No government doctors were coming. He posted on Facebook just an appeal to doctors in the private sector saying, we can't pay you what you might be earning in the private sector, but we will look after your stay, we will give you security, and we will give you the chance to do what you intend to do, which is heal people who need it. And it was remarkable, the appeal, uh, the kind of traction that one appeal got, and the number of private sector doctors who actually went and took him up on this for short term, one month, two month, three month kind of stints to go in there and help out. So don't underestimate the way that, like I said, social media is a bridge. Uh, these people who are trying to use mediums of communication to make that change. Now, it was interesting, the reason I bring this up is because his superiors were not too pleased about his appeal. And that to me is, I don't understand it, because this was uh, an innovative young officer who was desperate about the situation in his district, trying to use whatever means at his disposal without access to people in this room to get a message out. And it was a successful message. So I think you know, this kind of also makes the point that you were making, that we need people in positions of power, people who are in a position to impact change, to embrace the, you know, the world outside the, the ministries in, uh, in Delhi and in their state capitals, and accept that there might be other stakeholders outside who have a lateral entry point or a vision that may be able to help them. And coming back to uh, just uh, Ashini's point over there, uh, I, I know Ashini, we work together. Um, so, you know, we have had this conversation on algorithms and how they decide what you read. I think in that space, if, if somebody is truly interested in scholarship and truly interested in research, I think it is now incumbent upon all of us to actually make a conscious effort, understanding that technology does this, mm -hmm. to make a conscious effort to go and look for the other view. Does that mean you follow all kinds of different handles on Twitter that will be able to give you both sides? Maybe. Does it mean you read uh, you know, Breitbart and New Republic? Maybe. Uh, you'll, you'll have to make those choices consciously. And I think a lot of that is going to be incumbent upon us as individuals as well. Uh, anyone else to add to this? Otherwise, I'll take another round of questions. I'm just curious. Um, and one thing that I see in terms of the, uh, the continual technological changes uh, and what I would describe as uh, the increased velocity of information and policy flows and how um, the institutions manage 
that and the cost and the tensions it creates. Because the reality is that it is going to impact quality. And so how do you maintain quality and contain costs when there's incessant technological advances that require in terms of relevance and impact, how do you meet those and how do you manage those internally and more importantly, how does the community of think tanks in India jointly address those to contain cost and to manage the tensions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lata Reddy, and uh, I'm in the unique position of once having been a policy maker, now being very much a think tanker. I'm a fellow at uh, uh, the ORF, at the East West Institute, and at the CGIG in Canada. And I've had two brief points to make. One is, you know, you've talked about uh, how can think tanks really play a major role in influencing policy makers. And I'm intrigued that you both see um, policy makers and researchers in the same category in the introduction to this panel. I actually see researchers as having to influence policy makers. Um, and you can suggest a policy, but the actual policy maker would have to be somebody who has the authority to make policy. The uh, second point is that I think uh, I've been part of two global commissions, uh, both run of, uh, totally by think tanks. The secretariat is run by them. They raise the funding and so on and so forth. And one has been the Global Commission on Internet Governance. The other is are currently ongoing, the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And the think tanks that are running them have been Chatham House, uh, uh, CGIG in Canada, and Hague Institute of Strategic Studies, and the East-West Institute. And I think that uh, the, the interesting part of this is that the, these reports are going to influence policy. So think tanks have essentially created different mechanisms, not necessarily in-house research. They gather a group of people together whose voices they believe will be heard, form them into a commission, get a report out which will then go to them. The second point is I completely agree. You can't rule out social media just because it comes in bite-sized chunks. I think the trick is you've got three levels. You capture attention with a bite-sized chunk of a pithy a tagline or a photo or uh, some kind of interesting issue. You then get a little bit deeper for the person who's just a lay person or someone who's vaguely interested in the subject. And then you go deep in. So it really is up to the individual to keep, keep going to those different levels. And finally, I see the, the role of the think tank and researchers as being directed in two directions. One is to influence policy making governments, the, so that you actually change policies through your research. The other is to engage with laypersons, with your followers, and fellow researchers. Right. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. I think the essence of that was customizing our uh, mm. research outputs for our lunch. So uh, last two quick comments, please. Um, so I, uh, I'm Hardika. I'm an MBA candidate from UPenn. And uh, I want to say Mr. Padmanaman, uh, uh, Mr. Padmanaman, Mr. Kumar, and Mr. Sambandhan, uh, you made really interesting points. Uh, uh, Mr. Padmanaman's point about like there is a lack of respect for technology. And I see that uh, in this room, uh, in the sense, for example, your point about uh, uh, having to make snappy headlines, you don't have to come up with snappy headlines. You can just A-B test the headlines. The data will tell you which, which headline to use. Um, things and uh, and uh, to think that you know data can only be communicated in terms of an article it can be communicated in terms of an interactive dashboard uh, so the research methodology stays the same the way you communicate it should change uh, no one here talked about podcasts everyone has 30 40 minute long commutes uh, everyone has headphones on their heads when they're commuting uh, but no one's talking about I, I get my worldview from NPR and the Guardian I would love uh, my worldview to be informed by the Hindu or some other organization in this room, but I don't even have the choice. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, just. Point taken. Yeah, I mean, like a 30 minute, uh, I mean, a, a, a 3,000 word article can be a 30 minute podcast, uh, but uh, this is. Right. So, I understand. Thank you. 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 Thank you
yes. so much. I'm sorry, but we'll, I, I take your point. Mm -hmm. Final comment, Pam, and I'll open um, it up for wrapping up comments. I'm Sonal Desai at uh, NCAER. Um, I was actually struck by your comment on broadcasting versus engagement. And I think uh, for think tanks, uh, maybe we need to have some level of humility. Uh, the broadcasting sort of assumes this level of arrogance that we really know the answer. Okay? Uh, one of the things that we could also be doing is to uh, increase engagement through creation of data that other people can use and sort of um, analyze and think about and creatively engage with the data. Uh, so one of the things that NCER does is it actually collects household surveys, which some of them we put in public domain. We have 10,000 users, including journalists, who actually download and use it. Right. So that may be one way of handling it. Right. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Now I'm going to just I'm going to wrap this uh, panel up. Last 30 seconds to each of our panelists, and of course you can continue this uh, later. I can't say lunch because we have a working lunch. Please go ahead, Mr. Samandar. place where a lot of information comes from and that's come through broadcast. It's come through broadcast not in the sense of voiceover but we are broadcasting what's available. I think it's a very essential function of think tanks and that's exactly what Shruti meant and that's what the panelists meant. Uh, I would just like to add that um, there has been a lot of work done on uh, policy communication and think tanks in India right from Mayan Weiner, uh, the very famous uh, social scientist, uh, Professor A. Vaidyanathan, who was an economist, who is now retired. There's been a lot of work done on policy communication, and I think uh, we as communicators should, help, uh, should take upon ourselves a very limited task of seeing how policy communication differs from what we all been doing a few years ago. Thank you. I would respond to your question. I mean, it's not a question. In fact, it's a very good observation and suggestion as well. Uh, the question of podcast also involves the very important question of the medium. Uh, most of the research is taking place in language, you know, English, and uh, in other countries in their other languages, maybe in French and German. But in India, primarily the research is being taken uh, care of by, uh, by, by the medium of English. So how would you cater to the people who are living, who are not knowing English? Even by podcast, you need to find a set of uh, people who can really break those complex ideas into, the, into that particular medium, and then that particular audience can be catered to. So that is a very important question that must be looked into. Yeah, just a quick point. Uh, I feel uh, taking uh, from Tino's point on higher education particularly, I feel that uh, the, as people working in the research space in a policy setting, uh, I wouldn't call them think tankers. I mean, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think there is a strong responsibility there to help uh, uh, academic in institutions to engage and make the format of education more about engagement. Uh, while at National Law School, for instance, we never had that sort of exposure, but I think now this is a wonderful opportunity because there are many of us who are trained in these methodologies and are working in policy settings, so there is a lot to pass on. Right. <coughs> Maya, Shivna? Um, just a quick response. Uh, News websites certainly are using that technology. So the snappy headline, uh, we also know that if there's an article that may have a reference to Pakistan in one third of a sentence in paragraph seven, Pakistan will find its way into the headline because of the three or four tested, that is the one that will do the best. That is a problem, actually. I don't think that's the answer. So, you know, the idea is, again, if a think tank is supposed to try and fight for attention and space amongst a similar target audience, uh, they need to be able to use the technology or the facilities of mainstream media, but ensure that they're able to marry it to the scholarship that Tino is talking about. And I think that continues to be the challenge. I don't know if we'll be able to come up with some solutions, but you know, I'll leave it out there. So two quick points about what you said, ma'am, and uh, I'll end with what Jim has raised, the most relevant question about balancing cost. But to answer your question, uh, we did talk about video podcasts and podcasts, so please log on to Carnegie Endowment, so you'll have lots of podcasts if you want to do it, and that's a marketing pitch. Uh, secondly, luckily, uh, we are not selling fashion clothing, so we don't have to look for clickbait formats of headline writing. Please understand that our objective is very different than just to get audience. 
The idea is to get the relevant audience, the relevant stakeholder group, and the people who will matter in the public policy space, not just anybody. So we are not really chasing numbers blindly. We are chasing much more targeted, refined numbers. And if there is technology which will help us to do that, one will have to adopt it. There is no question of that. And that's why Anant works with us, because he will tell us how to respect technology. <laughs> Jim, going back to last point, and this is the most relevant. And since I have the dirty job of fundraising, uh, cost is an issue. Cost management will become an issue, but I don't think think tanks have reached a stage where a collaborative effort can help redu reduce costs. So yes, maybe a joint report, like Lata said, can help, but in terms of uh, economizing technology, which has happened in television, uh, for example, sharing broadcast feed, having a feed provider like ANI helping us reduce cost, it has not yet happened in technology because everybody's trying to do their own thing. So yes, the effort should be to standardize certain formats where everybody can use of a platform. I think that's a great uh, job creating uh, possibility or if uh, somebody can come up with a platform where think tanks can uniformly use that communication platform to communicate, that could be very helpful. But more importantly, and an encouraging note to all the youngsters, communicating in the policy space, as he said, is going to be a whole new industry altogether. And it is going to create many jobs, not millions of jobs to solve India's employment problem, <laughs> but many jobs which can help uh, uh, youngsters. Like you said, you have uh, your IT administrator doing your social media has no sense of the research. I think it is a huge scope for somebody who does research, knows the tools of research, is interested, and is wanting to be as communication savvy to take the public policy work. That is going to be a huge promising area of communication as we go along, but those were my limited points. And, uh, mm -hmm. Shivnath sums it up uh, really with the last word. I'm only going to say this, that you know, I think uh, this essence that of, of this entire panel has been that the transition to the digital think tank is essential and inevitable. Uh, we of course need to have a conversation amongst ourselves on how we define our target audiences how we, uh, you know, how publish our content, make sure it's the hero and not really get caught up in the numbers uh, as indicators for the influence game. I leave it at that. Please join me in giving a big round of applause to this very uh, accomplished panel.